Good evening. I am here with Kit Lachlan. He is a teacher of mine, a friend, and actually he is, his method has been one of the biggest influences on my life and on my training. And we've had Kit on the podcast twice before, probably two years apart. And if you mm -hmm. haven't heard those episodes, I would recommend that you go back and listen to them. Really, you have never experienced stretching until you've tried his method. It truly is stretching 2.0. We have an article actually called that stretching 2.0, mm -hmm. which was really a summary or my interpretation of his method after having done uh, two of his weekend workshops. Kit, thank you for coming back on. My dear friend, it's a pleasure. And you're right. We are friends. We, we're well, I don't have many friends, and I, I don't want that to sound like a you know a cry from the heart or anything like that. But the fact is, um, you meet people sometimes, and there's a connection there. That's all there is to it. And uh, yeah, we are definitely becoming friends. <clears throat> and of course, the other thing is that we're colleagues. We're interested in each other's projects, and I'm very pleased that you had had some success with our methods, especially I remember with respect to your back pain, that was, that was very good. We are here today to talk about meditation. So <clears throat> Kit is somebody who, I, rather than try and butcher <clears throat> a rushed explanation of, of his overall method, if you, if you haven't seen any of the previous podcasts, you need to just go back and check those out. I'll put the links in the description below. But Something that I feel like it does very well is he is an example of the Charlie Munger quote of take a simple idea and take it seriously. And his books on stretching, relaxation, meditation, they are all truly compendia on those topics. And what we wanted to dive into today is meditation, the mental or spiritual practice side of the method, where previously we were talking about the physical side of stretching. Look, it's such a good point, and even your introductory remarks just open up so many <clears throat> avenues. My program, if, if I have any program at all, is about demystifying things. That, for me, has always been something of, of deep interest. And I think in the current era, where many, many people <clears throat> are becoming interested in both relaxation and meditation. I think there has been a tremendous temptation in the internet world to immediately start breaking meditation down into questions like, well, what's your lineage? Um, what type of meditation is this? All the rest of it. And discussions on those kinds of things can become like so many other internet discussions. Um, my, my evidence is bigger than your evidence kind of thing, where, where really the discussion doesn't actually add much light to the situation at all really it, it just adds heat so i would like to say at the outset that those little posts that i put out recently i think one went up on facebook and one went up on instagram they have two elements to them one is the learning how to start meditating which i deeply believe is the most important part of meditating as in getting started firstly but also getting started with a decent set of simple instructions i think that is absolutely critical and we put those instructions out the other day i'm still waiting for my own teacher to comment on them by the way we may we may yet revise them <laughs> he may tell me that i've made some terrible mistakes but i don't think i have but look it will get you started and to actually get down on the floor whether you're doing a lying practice or a standing practice or a sitting practice um, to actually get started is far and away the most important step you'll ever take. It's now, we can, su we can such talk a good point just... that, that people make so much of a, a faff about looking for the right method or the right style. And it's a mistake that you see so much with training as well that people mm -hmm. sit and they just philosophize mm -hmm. and pontificate and masturbate about all these yes. different training methods. And mm. none of it is worth one ounce of cushion time in meditation or 30 minutes in the gym. Well, look, we, we were speaking about this yesterday, weren't we? Just, just when we had our little introductory chat about what we were going to talk about today. 
and you were talking about that in respect of training and I just, I just I remember shaking my head saying for fuck's sake go into a gym pick up something heavy <laughs> do some reps with perfect form if you know what perfect form is wait a couple of days or three days and then go back and lift something heavier because that that is the secret to weight training and look the engagement the actual doing is far and away the most important thing so we can link to the little little uh, instruction audio that I made the other day um, and I think there are some words that go with it as well and also too there is a very important video that goes with this which I made free the other day it used to be a pay download it used to be a massive two dollars I remember you bought it once two dollars anyway it's called how to sit for meditation and I just want to talk if I may just briefly about how to use that program because I realized that we have credited our audience with perhaps we've overly credited our audience with being able to sort things out for themselves but the fact is in the modern era and I'm, and I I'm not talking down to modern people at all when I say this but what has happened in the in the immense restructuring societally and culturally of of our ordinary dialogue between human beings <clears throat> Facebook and all the other social media have had an immense effect on the way people think and it has become clear to me that people are not thinking for themselves as much as they used to do <clears throat> well, that's the claim I'm going to make anyway and by that I mean it is so often the case that people need detailed and follow along instructions to get them going in many many different areas these days now is that a bad thing no, of course it's not a bad thing it's just merely a comment on a change in the way we assimilate information and let me just try and explain what I mean by that uh, both Olivia and I and I know you too can learn things from the written word now that is becoming an increasingly rare skill set believe it or not or well, at least this is my view we have people writing to us all the time where what they're writing is a bit like listening to Donald Trump speaking it's incoherent it's not it is not clear it is not possible often to discern exactly what it is that people are asking for I'm not I'm being serious here it's not a that doesn't happen all the time but it's happening much more often than it used to so what we have done and in fact even in the products that we sell from our website now we have we haven't dumbed it down at all in fact I don't believe in dumbing anything down but what we have done is we have built the structure for the programs into the programs themselves and we've decided to make them follow along rather than how we did with the mastery series which is a series that you know well where we literally gave people all the recipe elements and asked them to play with all of the exercises in any particular program and some of them have 20 or 22 I think is the highest number and then we asked them to make notes of which pro which of those elements affected them the most strongly which were the most difficult which were the easiest and so on and then to literally note down the exercise numbers and build their own program for themselves and and honestly speaking from the heart here that is far and away the best way to approach any material if you can do it but the resistance that we've had has been remarkable and a great many people have said it's just too overwhelming you know 22 exercises I just I can't find my way through that now to me that is truly baffling I just don't understand that but I also have to accept that this is reality this and is so it. when we and so, sorry go ahead no, no, no. All, I was, all I was going to add to, to, to that was, so when we made the Beginners series, which we're going to change the name of when we re-release it, when we made the Beginners series, Olivia and I decided to make the Beginners series, firstly, solo exercises only, and that's because so many people told us they literally don't have a partner that they can stretch with. Now, in the era of the pandemic, that has definitely become a more pressing thing, um, but then I, I remember writing back to this guy once saying, what do you mean you, you, you can't find someone to stretch you? Do you live on a desert island or something? Are you on your own? But what it is, is he just didn't want to ask for someone else's help and he didn't have a close enough friend nearby to get that friend to sit on his back leg, for example, which is a kind of an odd thing to ask a stranger to do. I agree with that completely. Um, so what we've done is we've, we have taken the requirement for partner exercises out of the beginning programs um, and instead of giving people a recipe that they have to select the ingredients from we have simply made it follow along so each of the programs are 15 so i think that longest one is 25 minutes long 
Anyway, I, it's not a spruik. I'm not. I'm not um, advertising this to your listeners at all. But merely to say, with respect to the meditation project, I, I've been a meditator for a very long time now, thirty something. I don't know, thirty-five years maybe. And I have realised that in the instruction that I've been lucky enough to receive from some truly excellent teachers over the years, there was a need, and a pressing need right now, to come out with some really, really basic instructions, just like the beginner stretching program, and where those basic instructions are simple follow along. You just put the recording on and you just follow along. Now, before you, you ask any detail about that, let me just add one other thing, because there is a great, I think, misconception about what meditation is, and we haven't yet spoken about it, and I'm very interested to hear what your thoughts are on what you think the project is all about. But let me just introduce this part of the conversation by saying there's a very famous sutta, uh, uh, or, or the Sanskrit equivalent is sutra, we say in English, um, called the Satipatthana Sutta, which talks about meditation in detail, and it's one of the very few um, sutras that actually talks about meditation, even though it's such a big part of Buddhism. That's interesting. We can explore the reasons why for that later, perhaps. But in that sutta, the speaker, the Buddha, talks about the four postures of meditation. This is what I want to talk about briefly. And I should also add, this, this is most important, one posture is not privileged over the other. And the four postures of meditation are standing, moving, lying, and sitting. They are the four postures. Now, if you think about it for a moment, what, what he might be arguing for there, and this, this is my own deep belief, there's actually no place and no activity where you can't practice. That is, those four postures exhaust human movement. So this is interesting <clears throat> that uh, we spoke with Daniel Ingram uh, a couple of years ago, who is an emergency medicine physician who basically completed meditation, or he, he got to the, the, the point in his Vipassana practice where he decentralized his consciousness. And we have, a, we have a full podcast on that if you're interested in his subjective experience. It's really fascinating. And he said that he, he obviously spent several years in total um, meditating with several months under retreat, but he used a lot of his time in the hospital as practice because he said what we don't realize is that even when we're working in a job that seems very cerebral, there's so much time in the day where you're walking down the hospital corridor or cannulating someone or whatever, where you actually can really inhabit the individual sensations in what you're doing. Now, just there was a couple of other things that you mentioned there. There's a lot of, lot of richness in there. Um, one of them was that you said that you've had to adapt the program because over time you've noticed that people have less agency or people aren't as able to look at a set of generic instructions and make it their own. And I've definitely mm. found that the, the clients that are most successful are the ones that they take a program and they turn it in, they fit it into their own schedule and they, they do make it their own and they put their stamp on it. But it's, it's that lack of playfulness um, is more of a systemic problem, I think, just with the fact that since, say, the 1990s, when the average attention span was 17 minutes, and now it's about nine seconds or 12 seconds or something, it's, it's been absolutely systemically destroyed by the, a lot of the, the technology. And unfortunately, expectations have fallen in line with that too. So, as you said, people are less willing to read the written word about taking instructions of things, but also they're expecting faster results with stuff, especially with things like meditation. And as a result, the people who get the most publicity are the ones that are totally willing to abandon all, all moral fiber and hit the lowest <laughs> common denominator of saying, you know, meditate like an advanced Zen monk in 12 minutes or um, use this yeah. like binaural beats program <clears throat> and achieve this. Or, and it's, it's exactly the same as the six minute abs of, or six second abs of the meditation world. But mm -hmm. I realize I've kind of, there was a lot in there. So um, where, I mean, what, how, how do we unpick this? Well, why don't we start at the very beginning and just talk about, well, let me ask you, 
what do you think the meditation project is? And, and look, we should also add that there are thousands of different types of meditation. In fact, there's a, <clears throat> a school of Buddhism in Japan, I don't remember its name, where the explicit pursuit of all of their practices, including meditation, is to make money. Um, and it is, it's a, it's a strand of Buddhism. There, there are some very interesting strands out there. But let me ask you, what do you, why would you recommend to anyone that they consider sitting on the cushion? And look, I want to just comment on that too. Standing, moving, um, lying, and we'll get back to the lying one in a moment because I, I believe that for most Westerners, uh, developing a lying meditation practice is actually more valuable to them than a sitting one. But I'd love we'll to come dig back into to that. that. In a second, yeah. it's, it's critical, and I'll, I will explain why in detail. But, but let me ask you first, and please talk and just override me. What do you believe? the meditation project is designed to do and why should we engage in it yeah this depends on the audience that i'm speaking to so i was mm. asked i was on the big picture medics podcast last week where the audience is junior doctors medics and they were asking what's the benefit of meditation and so for them you i think you have to appeal to the the evidence based desire behind them and you say well it improves emotional regulation and pain tolerance and um, improves cerebral blood flow under stress and you know so I, in that case, you've got to almost sell sell mm -hmm. it in the language that um, or improve concentration. You know, sell the, the benefits that that person would would benefit from. Because if you then if you go off the deep end and you say, well, it's to undo the illusion of self and the end of all suffering, <laughs> most people are going to be like, who is oh. this guy? Yeah, I'm. You know, this he sounds like he's having a <clears throat> psychotic event. Mm. So I think mm. it depends on the audience. Um, look, it, yes, it does. And that's, if I may say, that's a very wise perspective because uh, if you read enough or listen enough to the commentaries and also the what, what are alleged to be the original utterances of the Buddha um, in all of the different suttas that are recorded, you will see that he does exactly the same thing. That is to say, he positions the worthwhileness of the system, the Buddhist system, and it is, it's a system, it's a secular, it's not a religion, even though it is the official religion of Thailand, it's not a religion, it's actually a system, a deep, wide system, which has many aspects to it of mastering yourself, for want of a better term. <clears throat> and it's very hard to explain that, because as you say, the teaching of anatta or not-self is something that just, it would seem absurd and bizarre and completely unattractive as an idea to someone who has no experience in this system. So your point about tailoring the explanation of the worthwhileness of, Buddha, of uh, meditation to the audience is a very, in my opinion, a very sound thing to do. I mean, it's taught very much in kind of Silicon Valley um, sure. style circles as something that is it 70 percent of ceos have some kind of meditation practice but i imagine their reasons for doing it is very different as you said like part of some some people do it as a money-making thing to enable them to cut out distraction and improve their output and mm -hmm. you know i don't think it's not it's not to say that any one of those outcomes is is a wrong um motivation to do it but something that daniel ingram mentioned is we have to be aware that we are employing spiritual technologies here that are really designed to undo the illusion of self. And without knowing that, and without kind of being aware that this is one of the, it's not just a side effect or a, a risk, it is the goal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so <clears throat> if you if you do something without realizing that this could happen, then you could end up finding yourself in quite dodgy territory. And I think a lot well, of the look mindfulness kind of programs don't uh, really allude to this. Um, that's true, and we don't need to name the ones that we're talking about uh, because they are so popular now. Um, yeah, so I, I would much rather not actually really put some names to the mindfulness movements, and there are a number of them, but yes, you're right, and, and at least to the extent of my understanding, many of the, or some at least, of the fundamental perspectives of the original teachings and that's also another loaded thing, isn't it? Where do we find the original teachings these days? Well, there are some very good um, writers and practitioners around, 
But it could be argued that in the in the very instrumental pursuit of, let's say, greater productivity or <clears throat> improved sleep or all the other things that meditation is has there's evidence to support its effectiveness in these domains is really missing out on what it is really about. Having said that, I still think it's much better for people to start and to begin their meditation practice with a mindfulness or whatever they're exposed to because for whatever reason that happens to be on their life's journey the form of the teachings that they've been exposed to and that's no problem because once the methods <clears throat> get some kind of traction in you there'll be a very natural desire to want to go deeper don't you think yeah absolutely and i think this is why i really favor your method with inhabiting the body developing awareness using stretching as a tool because it means that you are the agent in mm -hmm. doing it you're, you're the one that's in control and it's much more um it's, it's empowering for the individual but it also means that you take it as far as you want to go whereas some of the more invasive approaches for um kind of spiritual technologies the ones that are either slightly more forced slightly more synth no, synthetic but interventionalist um, as well as obviously things like psychedelics, which are like Sam Harris described as strapping yourself to the front of a rocket with no guidance system. Like it's it's very powerful and it could take you to to a place that is that is where you want to go. But also it's so unpredictable and it could just drop you in a place of psychosis or in the dark elements of your unconscious mind without really having the tools to be able to navigate that. Whereas you, with your you, method, you yes. can you're much more oriented and able to take it as far as you want to go. I agree. So look, let us, I'll just adjust my picture a little bit now. I'm going to stand up. Let us now go into the detail of exactly the thing that you're calling my method, of course, is not my method. It's a, it is an approach. I'll take a step back. The goal, the, the, not the goal, the starting point of any meditation practice is actually an explicit acknowledgement that I desire to train my mind. I mean, that, I don't know, it doesn't sound terribly attractive perhaps, but because the relationship that most people have with what's going on between their ears or the constant chatter of their own mind, the relationship that most people have with that is that what is going on in my mind is actually real. And the reason why that is so is because in the person that has an untrained mind there is no alternative perspective to experience the thought stream from this is a really what's the word i'm looking for um it is a very subversive idea and if you really do get into the Buddha's system, you'll find it's one of the most radical systems that the planet has ever put forward for the transformation of an individual consciousness. But as you say, it is, well, in one sense it's self-directed, so look, we'll come back to that later. The method is very simple, in, in one sense, it's extremely simple, so let me talk about that and, this, and people can just follow this prescription and actually get started meditating in two minutes now not have success within two minutes, but the basic method itself is not hard to understand. So let me describe it. You adopt a sitting posture, <clears throat> and this can be done in an ordinary kitchen chair or any chair at all, one that allows you to sit up reasonably straight is normally the recommendation. So your, your bottom is on the seat of the chair and your back is not supported by the chair. And in the beginning, and when I say in the beginning, I mean in the first 20, 30 seconds, simply move your hips around, forward and backwards, and maybe left to right, and then lift your chest a little bit and bring the chin back in uh, so that the head and neck move further over the centre of your balance and so on. And just have a feel of your body in that position. <coughs> that is the first instruction. And now what's interesting to me, having listened to many, many people grapple with these instructions, is, and this is why I spent, you know, 35 years of my life developing the stretching system that we have now, is because 
many modern people the first instruction to feel your body literally does not connect. They can hear the words, feel my body, they understand the meaning of the individual components of that sentence, but they don't actually feel their own bodies. It's amazing so that's that, fascinating that, is, that that is actually a continuum that you go yes. from that you're right that before starting any of this kind of work that I've done with you, you know, all of my practice had been very much neck up and the sensations that I felt, I thought, well, that's the maximum level yes. of granularity that I can feel. But mm. looking back, it was really just gross sensations, like really blunt mm. stuff. And actually mm. you can go deeper and deeper and obviously doing a 10 day Vipassana retreat where you're mm. fully focused on the, the little atomic movements within your body, you realize there's so much richness in what you can feel. Well, it, there's, there's a universe inside you. <clears throat> Simple as that. Anyway, so that's the first thing. You're sitting on a chair and you're feeling your body. And, and let's say in the beginning those feelings are not clear. And we'll come back to that because for most meditators, <clears throat> and your experience on that 10-day retreat, you may have some comments on this, most meditators' overwhelming experience on their first retreat is pain somewhere in the body or... or <laughs> Yeah, um, is that is that connecting? Oh my God. Okay, we'll, we'll we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that, and the, the reason we'll come back to that. And please remind me about that because whilst pain, whilst physical pain is a common experience on a retreat, it is completely unnecessary. And as you know, that was my entry into teaching meditation in Buddhist monasteries in Asia was taking that set of teachings to the, the home of Buddhism and having and, and working with, with students, sometimes long-term meditators have been meditating for as long as I have, but to bring that physical component so much more explicitly into the meditation practice completely transformed their own practice because what it does, and you've already commented on this, it brings you out of your head, which is where thinking happens for most people, and into your body. Now two things happen here, but we'll come back to that because I'd like to just briefly encapsulate the method, otherwise I'll, I'll end up talking for an hour and still people will be at the feeling the body stage. So, so you're sitting on a chair, so we're still 10 seconds into your first experience of starting to learn how to meditate. You're sitting in a chair, you can perhaps feel your bottom bones against the hard wood of the chair if you're sitting on a wooden chair. And then we posit what's called the meditation object. Now, as you noted in your own podcast on meditation, the standard recommendation for the meditation object is, well, it's normally described as the breath. And, and also, too, that there are some terrible instructions given about watching the breath. Don't watch the breath. I'm going to say that is a serious misdirection and yet it's the very first experience or the very first instruction that many people have in their practice and it's one of the reasons why the, the practice doesn't bear the, the fruit that it can. The instruction that I much prefer is feel the movements in your body we call breathing. Breathing is a word, it's a concept, it's not breathing itself and just like in that, that old Zen parable about the finger pointing at the moon we want the experience and if you want the experience of something you it, it I should say meditation is an embodied practice and now everyone says that but what does that actually mean it means that the body that you're in right now sitting on that chair feeling your bottom bones that is the body that we will meditate with no one else's, none others, not at any different point in time or space. This one sitting on the chair right now. My body, your body. So, some people recommend closing your eyes or softening your gaze if that, if that connects with you. But, it, it, but all these practices can be done with eyes wide open too if you want. It's just that for most people, because the visual cortex is their main mode of stimulation these days, it's probably helpful to reduce the stimulation on the visual cortex. And the easiest way to do that is just to lower your gaze to a meter or two in front of you and then let it softly go out of focus. But we'll come back to that because you can do it with eyes closed as well. <clears throat> okay, so 
as you sit there feeling your bottom bones on the seat, you become aware, or you will become aware if you direct yourself to the movements that we call breathing, you'll become aware that in fact your body while sitting on this chair is anything but still. It's actually moving subtly all the time. And we, we can put some labels on some of these movements that might be helpful. For example, when you breathe in, feel what happens in the body when you breathe in or find the movements in the body that we would label breathing in. Now, we don't prescribe these things because some people, for example, would much prefer the sensation of the breath at the nostril, so we might describe that as a kind of one-pointed concentration, or it might be that the person who's trying these instructions for the first time is actually aware of the space of the whole room that they're in. One is not better than the other. The question to be answered at all instants in your practice is what is happening now? It is so much more subtle and it's so much simpler than everyone will tell you. But what you'll observe as soon as you identify either the nostrils in the narrower focus or your tummy, which is my preference. Most people can feel their tummy. I'm using tummy in the the non-anatomical sense of just feeling the body <clears throat> from the ribs down to the hips, let's say. That part of the body there, we might, if we're going to be technical, we might say your abdomen. Feel what happens in your abdomen as you breathe. This is fascinating. And, it, and so let's say as you breathe in, you feel something. I don't want to preempt what you might feel, but as, you, as the breath goes out, it's a different something, it's a related something, but it's a different something. And as you say, it's rich, it's rich. And not only is it rich, there is no limit to how deeply you can go into it. But here is what happens. If you're sitting there doing the feeling as I suggest, at some point in your practice, we might be 30 seconds into the first minute or we might be a minute in, a thought will come into your mind. You will notice that a thought has come into your mind. And that is your first act of meditating. Meditating is about noticing what's happening. And so, as I speak about in this little introduction to meditation, I've heard many, many people say, well, it was. I had a really bad meditation practice today, and the teacher will say, "What? What do you mean a bad meditation practice? What happened?" And the person will say, "Well, I noticed that I was being constantly distracted." And if you're working with a good teacher, they should say something like, "Well, actually, that is meditation, noticing that you're being distracted, and yet, when you when you uh, when you become aware that your awareness has followed a thought." noticing that your awareness is no longer in the movements in your body because remember that's the primary meditation object and your task as far as you can is to hold your awareness and this critical next word hold your awareness gently on your meditation object because it's possible and I've seen this happen a million times the people with um, strong concentration and, and usually with good intellect as well, they will screw themselves down and yep. literally force themselves to follow those sensations. So that's that's just being harsh on yourself. And, that's, and believe me, that's a dead end too. Um, but but that we'll discuss that later perhaps. So my suggestion is when you notice that your awareness has moved from the sensations in your body which we are setting ourselves up somewhat artificially, I agree, as our primary object. When you notice that your attention has moved towards the thought stream and you're starting to engage in what it is that you're thinking about and then you remember, oh, that's right, I'm meditating. I'm supposed to be aware of what's happening in my body in terms of the movements. Then don't be harsh on yourself, just smile to yourself. I, oh, I always just laugh and just say, there's that mind again, you know, doing the thing that it does well, which is to distract us all the time. Now in the beginning, 
you may find that it's very difficult to do that. But please don't say you know, to yourself, and so many people do this, oh, I, I can't meditate, I'm just too distracted all the time. No. What, what the practice is simply this. As you notice more often that you're being distracted by your thoughts, you smile to yourself and you gently bring your awareness back to whatever your meditation object is and you gently stay with that and stay with that until something else happens. That's all. And what's happening in the process of you noticing that your awareness has been drawn away by your thoughts and then gently bringing your awareness back to your meditation object, you are strengthening your capacity to concentrate. This is a profound gift to give yourself. Now I'm not talking about strengthening your capacity to concentrate so you can be more productive or any of those other instrumental things that people so often talk about in relation to this. No, I'm talking about being more aware of the processes inside you that are even more you than your mind. That's what I'm talking about. And it does have all sorts of benefits and we might talk about those later if we ever talk about, for example, well, I'll mention it now. Everyone in their life has some aspect of themselves which they experience as sticky. And by, by that I mean, let me talk from personal experience. That'll make the point clearly and simply, I hope. But for many, many years, the big problem that I had personally was irritation slash anger, but always lurking. So when things were not satisfactory, and that's, I use that word deliberately because I remember talking to a student once uh, and I used the word, the, the Pali word dukkha, which translate, is normally translated into English as suffering. And this guy said to me, he looked at me scornfully and said, there's no suffering in my life. I'm just looking at his face and I'm seeing the face of suffering. And, I, and so I reframed what I said. I said, okay, no suffering. But what about unsatisfactoriness? And he just cracked up. He said, there's plenty of that. So look, the, this, again, this is the, the trap of words. We do not want to get trapped in some kind of conceptual understanding of this practice. No, it is a direct embodied physical practice. And look, I'll add one thing and then please ask me some specific questions. What, what the beginning meditator does not know yet because they have no experience of it, except perhaps for um, acts of contemplation which have manifested by themselves at some stage in your life where you were sitting watching nature or watching the moon come up or something, whatever it is and you realize that you're actually lost in the direct experience of that thing and people will label such experiences as mystical or ecstatic experiences. In fact, those experiences, that wonderment, uh, are available to you all the time, but in order to access them, you have to, and listen to these next words because they're critical and this is partly my contribution to this art, the, when we directed your attention to the sensations in the body that we call breathing, and this is not an obvious thing, but when you actually experience sensations in the body, you are present. Meaning, you're not in your thought stream, and the thought stream, I should add this detail as well, and, and people will probably find this very objectionable, but thoughts in the thought stream sense, thoughts are never experienced in the present. They are always thoughts about the future, a future which may or may not come, or they're thoughts about a past. Even if we're talking about the past of only a second or two ago, the th thoughts do not occupy the present moment. And for many people that is a, it's a truly shocking thing to contemplate for a moment. Well, what, what do you mean? Oh, and, then, and then someone's mind will always go along this path. Well, does that mean when I become a good meditator, I'm going to lose the capacity to use my mind constructively or productively? Or will my learning, the, the six years I've just spent at med school, will that suddenly vanish if I become a meditator? No, of course not. 
What will be taken away from your mind though is its obsessiveness. Now when I say obsessiveness, what do I mean? Well, who listening to this conversation has not had the experience of waking up at three o'clock in the morning thinking about something and not being able to put that thing down? Well, the answer is everyone, right? Yeah. If someone has not had that Absolutely. experience, I, I, I want to talk to them because maybe they're like Pabna Sambhava and they, and they came into this world fully enlightened, <laughs> uh, floating down the Ganges River on a lotus blossom. That's possible. But I've not met anyone like that in my own life. The people that I regard as having transformed themselves, and that's as far as I go, I won't talk about enlightenment because I think that's a, a totally fanciful thing to even consider as a person who's contemplating will I begin to meditate or not. The most important thing by far in the meditation instruction is to do it. That's the first thing. And secondly, to really pay attention to what's actually happening, not what you think is happening. And the way to do this most honestly with yourself is to attend to your physical sensations because I'm, I'm going to make another big claim here. And the claim is your body has only one language and that is the language of sensation and most sensations in the beginning are experienced on a three axis or not a three axis that's incorrect on a continuum where you have unpleasant sensations at one end you have pleasant sensations at the other end and somewhere in the middle here are sensations that are neither pleasant nor unpleasant in the beginning your capacity to distinguish between these things is limited and that's because we in our culture are simply not trained to either to attend to our sensations except when they are painful and you know they're bothering us or they're disturbing us in some way but in fact what most people don't realize is that your body is talking to you all the time and its language is sensation now why should we care about this i mean i know I have met plenty of people who regard their body as fundamentally an impediment to doing what it is they want to do. You know, I can't stay awake for long enough or blah, blah, blah. I will argue that the only things that are really important to you in your own life are the things that the body experiences. And let me just describe what I mean by that. The experience of sexual pleasure, for example, or the experience of eating good food or the experience experience of holding someone who you love and who loves you this is something yeah. you you mentioned in your in the last episode where you said that it is only the body that can experience the present and you said mm. just before that thought is always a marker of time it's always the symbol of something slightly in the future or the past even if we're thinking the thought at the time and i think it's a bit of a weird claim to make until you experience and i think the only time i truly felt that at a, at a real intuitive level was the 10-day retreat when i mm. felt that every thought has a physical counterpart and mm -hmm. vice versa and it's almost as if the thought that is associated with any sensation is like the time stamp it's the the marker in time that of that precisely. physical That's precisely what it is sensation yes. So that, um, that method that you've really clearly described there, hopefully anyone listening who is procrastinating about meditation and what, to, what style to do or, or has heard some of these previous um, recommendations of people saying watch the breath or whatever and um, not really got it, hopefully that's enough to um, stimulate them to do it. And, I, and most people listening to this will have been lifting weights for at least some time. And so it's going to seem, you know, if someone came up to you and said, oh, I'm thinking of starting to lift weights, but I don't know whether to do daily undulating periodization or linear progression or five, three, one, you'd be like, well, look, man, just go in the gym and just do something, just do five by five. And they'll be like, oh, but is it really optimal? You'd be like, it doesn't matter. Just, <laughs> just get in and do something. So I think that, that message of just sit on the cushion and do it. And, and you, you also addressed my, what's going to be my next question, which was, if someone says, I'm not a meditation person, or I can't switch off, um, then you know, you, you've, you've dealt with that. And I think 
this comes down to the personality type of the individual that if you have someone who as you said is very type a and is used to getting results with things by brute force and white knuckling that they'll try and like grind their way through meditation and the almost paradoxical effect of that is that meditation is if you do that you're agitating the mind it's almost like you've got a, a glass of water with some sand in and by you're trying to like force the sand to stay still by like shaking mm. it more <laughs> it's like adding mm. more energy into the system mm -hmm. rather than letting it go and actually that letting go process can be harder for people of the opposite disposition whereas mm. as you said um i think on the the workshop that in thailand people are more of the relaxed bordering on lazy disposition Hmm. The, the ones that meditate and so they need more of the hardline type a stuff so i mm -hmm. guess it's about auto regulating recognizing what is your personality type and what is needed in your practice right now i'm i'm assuming that i'm speaking to an audience of typical westerners and and people might hate such a simplification and such a generalization but generalizations are generally true um, and yes, you might be an exception. As a listener, you might not fit this perspective. The reason, I'll come back to something now that I, I glossed over before, but the reason why I think that most Westerners, and I'm assuming that we are talking about Westerners that you've labelled as a type A type, rather than someone who is afflicted by what the scriptures call sloth and torpor, um, and 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 there's such beautiful words because immediately you can see well am I which type am I am I the type that will that is completely comfortable lounging around on a couch and procrastinating my entire life away I'm, of course I'm caricaturing here but to make a point or am I go 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 type A personality um, where I literally force reality to fit what I want well I would if I were talking about my former self I would say I'm the, I'm the latter type for sure. So when, um, when you it, said that someone has a session and they're like, oh, it was a terrible session because I was distracted all the time, that's a little clue that someone is of that type of personality where they're beating themselves up and they're really self-critical. But it's the mm -hmm. same as saying, oh, I, I went to the gym and it was a terrible session because I did loads of reps and, yeah. and hard. Like, well, that's fine. No, it, it, it is completely fine, and this is something that well, we have, you know, we a lot of people on our forums, as you know, really hardcore strength training athletes or, or people who are bodybuilding or, you know, so similar, very similar to your audience. And there's no such thing as a bad training session. In fact, in fact, if we really, if we really get down to this, there's no such thing, good and bad as such, we have this tendency to jump straight in and ju make judgments or label things in this pejorative way. The, from, my, from my experience now, there are only things that are useful or not useful, not good or bad. And by, what do I mean by that? Well, in the pursuit of whatever goal you have, and let's say f for at least some of your students, the goal will be hypertrophy then it's very easy to measure. Are you slowly getting stronger? Are you slowly putting on muscle weight or not? And all training regimens can be ranked or are ranked against the effectiveness of producing that outcome. That's all. Yeah, how that simple makes sense. Is, how simple like, is that? Does it serve this goal or does it not? That's so it. something you mentioned there as well, I've... I've I, I've got a few kind of quick fire questions for you that I'd love to get to as well. But um, a recommendation that like last time we, we chatted in London, um, we were talking about this this difference in kind of Western and Eastern dispositions or the, the sloth torpor thing, and particularly with relation to knowledge workers. Now, I'm a knowledge worker in both of my jobs. Medicine and propane are both very cerebral and they they involve a lot of computer time i think people don't realize mm -hmm. that being a doctor is 95 percent clerical on a computer mm -hmm. and even the mm -hmm. interactions with patients it's 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 obviously very um very neck up because of all of the, the bits of information you've got to weigh up now mm -hmm. you said to me yusuf in your case i don't think your bottleneck is concentration in meditation 
think your bottleneck is the body and you recommended that I go away and do six months of lying relaxation, which mm -hmm. I did and noticed a huge improvement from. And uh, you said we would loop back to lying meditation. One of okay. the big insights that I that I got from that just before we go on to that is um, what you said about like breathing, for example, is is a process. It's not a it's not a, a thing. Mm. And lying on the floor, <laughs> it's it sounds so stupid that when you think you're lying on the floor at least for me it takes a good 15 minutes until i'm actually lying on the floor mm -hmm. okay. most people you know really you're just when you for the first 10 to 15 minutes of lying on the floor you're actually like even when you think you're relaxed it's only by comparison like 20 30 minutes later that you're like oh here we go like now the floor is holding me mm. that's precisely it Oh, there are just so many things to say. Oh, look, I'll, I'll cut it short because I, we've already been talking for quite a while, but how many people listening have had this experience? They'll be getting wound up about something <clears throat> and the person they're talking to you will say, for God's sake, just relax. And your response is going to be something like, what do you mean? I am relaxed, <laughs> right? And like, I, 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 have you heard that thing, never in the history of telling someone to calm down? Have they calmed down? <laughs> Has it ever been affected? That's right. Well, so let me take. I'm I'm boiling here. Let me, you can see my face is red. Hang on a tick. Always happens in the hospital with oh, that's better. security. So look, um, the reason I recommend, the reason uh, I'm vocal in recommending developing a, a lying relaxation practice, which is actually meditation, it's just a different form of it, is that for most Westerners who do find it hard to get out of their heads and find it, well, sometimes completely alien, the idea of connecting with their body, except in terms of the instrumental terms that you're talking about, like, okay, I've been, I've been curling 35-pound dumbbells, now I'm going to move on to 40-pound dumbbells. Yes, that's connecting with your body, but it's in a very limited sense, and it's using a, a tiny fraction of the available bandwidth, is, is how I would put it. It's actually, let, let me take a step back and say, learning how to meditate is actually about unlearning a whole bunch of unconscious habits that you have, which you cannot not have, being a Westerner living today. And what, peop what people simply don't realise is that their own experience of themselves as normal, the usual, this is me, I am like this and I'm like that, None of those things is accurate, in fact, and it's not until you have the deep, deep experience of being fully relaxed that, that well, that'll be your first insight, in fact. And people talk about meditation. There are schools of meditation. One of them is called insight meditation or vipassana, which is the type that you have studied. The first insight that I personally had was that I was never relaxed. Never relaxed and I'm, I'm sure that that descriptor would describe you know a great many people listening although you might think you're relaxed what does being deeply relaxed actually feel like firstly what does it feel like and secondly this is the most important part and it's identical in the way to the development of the concentration that will come as a result of gently bringing your thoughts back to the meditation object a thousand times is that when you do have the capacity and the direct experience, I should say, first and then secondly, the capacity to be deeply relaxed, and this will not sound realistic, but it is, I promise you, relaxation is just another habit. Being tense, which is most people's state, and their bodies are physically hard when you touch them, all the muscles in their body are held rigid, that's just a habit you've learnt too, but you were not aware that you were learning that habit. This is a profound thing, Yusuf. Once you have the experience of being deeply relaxed, two things will happen. Firstly, in your normal daily life, you will notice when your tension levels are rising, you'll feel your shoulders come up around your ears, and you'll just say, oh, I can let that go now. And secondly, the feeling of being deeply relaxed is something as crazy as this sounds, that you can choose to return to at any time. And what you notice as, again, this capacity strengthens is 
Ah, feeling relaxed is actually way better. It feels way better and my mind works better. I think more clearly, etc., 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 when I am more relaxed. And look, if anyone in the audience is a martial artist or a boxer or somebody who's in the combative sports, you and I'm speaking as an ex amateur boxer myself, I was never a very good one, I also have to acknowledge that, but I did learn one or two things, but the fact is you cannot move quickly unless you're relaxed, and that's why we use the cat as our model and not dogs. As I've mentioned to you many times, we are much more dog-like in the sense that we, are, we care much more about what other people think about us than cats do. Cats normally, are, they're more solipsistic, they're more self-referencing. And it very rarely serves us as well. So in, in the boxing, the, the, the boxing example, you don't, you're not a better boxer if you're too tense. In the social example with the dogs, if you're always seeking approval, you know, there's the standard thing of like, you're trying to chat up a, a girl that you fancy. And if you're tense and, you know, you just, ah, ah, and it's like, it's not like, and then as you said, you lose the cerebral capacity to even think properly, articulate yourself. It's just, it, the whole pattern doesn't serve you. But as you said, it's kind of become the resting baseline. And the mm. way that I kind of interpreted your, your method is that the reason that awareness is needed to be developed first is because we're not even aware of how much of this tension habit mm. we have in the first place. And as you said, you can kind of prod people and you realize like, oh, actually their, their neck's really tight or their chest is tight or whatever. But you have to develop the awareness first to realize that what you think is mm. your baseline relaxed state is actually mm. a resting level of tension. And it's only then that you can then start to move that set point mm -hmm. into yes. a more relaxed state. And once yes. you can then access that more and more, you then anchor yourself in that new set point and then it becomes mm -hmm. the new norm. That, that is a, a, I'm not quite a very there nice sci scientific way of describing it, yes. Look, so, something, something else that's into it. Let me just speak about this briefly. <clears throat> I spoke before about the thought stream. The thought stream are just those thoughts that keep generating themselves without you actually doing anything to generate them. And you, you really need a certain stillness to be able to see this. And so let's talk briefly about once you've seen how many new thoughts are produced every second. Let's say that might take you, it could happen the very first time you sit. You could, you could end your first sitting session saying, oh my God, that, I had no idea. I was, I was thinking so much. I had no idea that I actually cannot pull myself away from that thought stream. And you've got to acknowledge, and I would always acknowledge that the thought stream itself is extremely seductive. And the reason is, Yusuf, is that you, the thought stream believes it's you. Mm -hmm. I am thinking, I am having these thoughts and the implication there is there must be something important about them. And if they're thoughts about me, well, of course they're important, right? That is the, the shape of our culture. It's, it's a weird, but because it, it is the thing which we think it, it's, it's, it's kind of a closed loop because we think it's the mm. thing which is also the thing that we are assessing the thing mm. by. It's very mm. hard to get out of that. But the recognition that the mind is just secreting thoughts like the pancreas yes. is secreting insulin and yes. it's going to do it regardless yes is such That's a job yeah and I, I think in those deep states of relaxation you're like ah oh, mind is just doing what it does and i'm over here mm -hmm. yeah and now then, that just just stop there that's that two things uh oh, no, it's about 25 things but let me just <laughs> choose the most important one okay i'll tell a quick story um i was on retreat once in berkeley California and I was in a small <clears throat> I think two and a half or four mat room some very small like a small office on a floor on Japanese flooring tatami and I was doing a, a guided relaxation practice where <clears throat> um, we should I should add and we can pr probably add links to to this underneath where this video will appear we have a huge number of audio recordings, many of which I've recorded while I've been teaching on these monasteries and what they are is a guided relaxation exercise. They're also, they're lying meditation too. Um, the, the words that we use to carve up these experiences are really not terribly helpful and I'll maybe talk more about that later. 
they are they're available for for download on on your website as well because i yeah they're, they're free there's, they're, there's they're, one they're for free. there's one for back pain which i basically know by heart now um that i listened to every night for a few months and, and made a big difference and they work yep they work don't they very much yeah okay so i was in this room um and I was going through, part of the practice might be, for example, you say to yourself or you feel, you feel or visualise right hand, thumb, index finger, middle finger, blah, blah, blah. Get, walk your way all right around the body, which I think is very much in sync with the Goenka idea of scanning your body, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so I'm Goenka in this kind room. Of top down. Top down or sometimes bottom up. Um, it doesn't, and again, it doesn't matter. You just have to start. The, the thing here is to actually engage in the process, the... The details of the process are actually, in my view, not that important, but engaging in the process is. So anyway, I was in this room lying on my back um, and trying to relax as much as possible, um, and I, I heard someone snoring. And I thought about it for a moment. It was probably only a split second or a second or two, and I thought, I'm on my own in this room. Who's snoring? Now, this is, this is profound. This is insight number two, I, I guess. I, I suddenly realized with complete clarity that my body was awake, uh, asleep, I should say, and snoring, and my mind was wide awake and clear. And, of course, that woke me up immediately. That stopped the practice. But ever since then, that dissociation of the thought stream and the mind's activity from what the body is doing is something that happens every time I do a lying relaxation practice without fail. Now, here's the key point. When the body falls asleep <clears throat> like this by itself, its state of deep relaxation is profound. And the mind is still awake. And I know that I've said this to a few people and people say, oh, that's just not possible to do that. When the, when the body falls asleep, the mind falls asleep too. No, that's not true. And in fact, there's a whole school of meditation which, uh, uh, which is done only in that state when the body is physically asleep and the mind is wide awake. All, that, all of the guys that are into astral projection and um, out-of-body experiences say that, that that's, the, that's the prerequisite. That's the, it is. The, it's the step the, one. It, the, it's the first dissociation, but I, I personally have no interest in those, in those other practices. My practices are all about trying to help me to become a better human being. So it's the here and now, the world that we're living in right now that's of most interest to me. But anyway, here's the point, and this now comes back to a point that you made about five minutes ago, which is, at some point, you will have the experience that a space in which you're meditating has opened up where your thoughts can actually be seen to be occurring. Now, just exactly in physics terms, what that space is, I would not like to try and say. But everyone who's meditated for a long while will have had the experience of literally being able to see their thought stream. You will see the generation of thought, a new thought, it flows left to right, let's say, across however you experience your thoughts, and a new thought, and a new thought. But as, and this is the critical thing that ties the physical work into the meditation project, and why I believe it's so critically important to learn how to relax, I'm going to argue that that space I've just described cannot open for you without a state of deep, deep relaxation. And that can happen when you're sitting, it can happen doing standing practice. I, I've done a lot of standing practice and I've also done a lot of walking practice as or moving practice as we were talking about the other day one practice we haven't spoken about breath counting yet and we should come to that because that's another way of, of just checking yourself to see whether or not you're falling asleep and dreaming that you're meditating because that can also happen too how do we know that we're actually awake that's actually a very deep zen question too how do you know you're awake turns out to be a lot more complicated than you think but anyway that the space and seeing the thought stream is a second great insight because suddenly you realize this and normally these feelings and sensations and ideas come in pretty rapid succession you suddenly realize that there is a space that you whatever that is inhabit that is not your thought stream and for me personally when i saw that so clearly 
I felt an immense weight being lifted off my shoulders, you know. I had this experience that, oh, thank God, I don't have to be or do anything. Now, that, that doesn't sound to a Westerner like much of a, an attractive state or, or insight, but it's, it is truly liberating, liberating in the core sense of feeling like a prisoner who's been let out of jail. That's what it felt like to me anyway. And as a result, the, the things that most people are most concerned about most of the time are things which don't occupy my thinking at all. They, they, so I, I, there's, a guy so, called, yeah, um, there's a guy called Gary Webber who I've been oh, following yeah. for some time and uh, I think, you, yeah, you know of him. Um, yes. He had a, a, also a, a, the, the sense of his thoughts stopping and his life still oh. carrying on the momentum of, um, of playing out what he does. And what he said was, my life runs a lot better without me in it. I know it sounds, it's paradoxical to say that, of course, but I understand exactly what he means. And there's something else here too. Um, I have heard on actual retreats where the teacher running the retreat will say something, and I regard this as honestly, genuinely stupid, but anyway, I'll repeat it anyway. Empty your mind. Now, I remember my reaction the first time no, I heard I someone to do say, <laughs> well, no, I said, mate, if I could do that, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> what are you talking about? And so realizing that for an, for an advanced meditator, that is something they can actually do. That is, that's a fact. Empty your mind. But in fact, it's an advanced practice. And well, it is the, not a, this is like the, the concert pianist or the concert violinist expect or the ex expert diver hmm. because they've got it in muscle memory. They forget that actually the yes. someone who's not that can't just jump off the 30 foot board because no. they have to go through the process yes. first and say, oh, just yes. do a double flip off the 30 foot board. It's like, well, hmm. not really. So, <clears throat> so yeah, I've, um, I've got a few uh, quick fire questions for you as yeah, well. Go. Um, I, I, I feel like I've, I've jumped in mid thought there though. Mm -mm. No, okay. and look, it's something else. But let me just add this detail to what I've just been speaking about. This process that I'm talking about is fundamentally circular. It is not a linear or even randomly linear progression. You literally come back to the beginning again and again and again, but you have more insight about what it means to be you and to experience this life and all those things. That's what changes. Um, you'll probably seem a bit more relaxed to people outside uh, yourself. I mean, what I'm, by that I mean your, your partners or your parents or people around you may comment that they, they notice you seem to be a bit more relaxed these days and also, as I'm fond of saying, happier for absolutely no reason at all. Um, and all of that will happen in time. But the key thing is to pay attention, whether you're sitting, standing, moving or lying, to what's actually happening now, what's actually happening now. And the take home message from this part of what I'm talking about is the access point and the, the, the method that will never let you down is to tune into your own body. Now look, ask me those quick fire questions, but if we have time, I'd like to come back and talk to you about how I've used these same techniques to work with my own personal affliction, which is anger. Yeah, absolutely. So I would be... ask, me, ask me the quick fire questions. So the first one is some, somebody who is asking me, this is actually the opposite problem to what you've described, which is when someone sits down to meditate, normally the issue is I'm not getting much of a feel for what I, the sensations are too crude and too, um, um, you know, struggling to really finesse what's going on and feel what's going on. This other person that asked me said, I struggle to meditate because everything's so intense. I, and she's a very emotional person. She's very, um, not histrionic, but she's like right up there. And, and so she says, if she sits down to meditate, she'll immediately get very tearful and feel a lot of turmoil inside. What would you say to somebody like that? Interesting. Uh, well, but, but but then I'm a. When I was in a yoga school, my my the name that I was 
given uh, was Dharma Vira, which means hero of the Dharma. Basically, it's a, a, it's a description, a sarcastic, I would say, a description of my approach to doing everything, which is to dive in. Um, I would, if I were that person and I was experiencing those things, I would simply direct myself to relax more and relax more because you cannot have any emotional experience happen in the body without what you described as that concomitant physical state and so you need to feel where in the body this state is being manifested or being again the words are wrong because because emotions are actually properties of the body they're not properties of the mind although the mind can certainly cause the emotions to be felt and that's probably what's happening in her case um, it's no it's not any benefit in my opinion to think about or to try and analyze where or what memories are associated with this experience being manifested but rather in a safe controlled environment to allow yourself to experience the physical sensations of it with no commentary no explanation and definitely no analysis now most people find that really hard and the, the what's underneath all emotions and again, with, this is another long conversation we're about to start, but what's underneath everything is fear. And the deepest fear, of course, is fear of being extinguished. I, I am going to stop. Everyone, everyone in the West knows that their life will end, but absolutely no one spends any time contemplating what that actually means in the body to know that your life is going to end. Well, that, that fear is um, experienced in a microcosm hmm. when you are stretching in a position where you feel not fully safe and mm. there was definitely particularly in the hip and piriformis and pigeon stretch That's in the right. workshop people were bursting into tears mm. and i think i guess this is part of the reason why you you have so much emphasis on support in the stretches and making sure mm. that the muscles are feeling supported you have a partner that's that's leaning into you rather than pressing into you that mm -hmm. that you feel like you're being cradled so you can relax into that stretch that would have previously felt unsafe yes. am i on Absolutely. the right track there oh 100 percent on the right track um there's more of course uh the, the comfort thing and the feeling safe thing they're simply the prerequisites for actually doing any useful work because this is not an obvious thing but you cannot make muscles flexible just by forcing them to lengthen you'll tear something if in fact you're a fear-based kind of person because your own protective mechanisms will be so strong that as you try and force that muscle to lengthen they'll just contract harder look um, but what you said is gold because and this is the real reason for doing all the supported stretches and making sure that the intensity is not too much but it has to be enough to provoke a result and all the rest of the things that we've spoken about you are literally holding yourself on the edge of a long razor blade that's actually what's happening and you will be 100 percent totally fully present with the sensations because they're strong they're not so strong that they overwhelm you but I guarantee you, if you cast your mind back to those moments, you were not thinking about anything. Your mind was completely clear. What, and panic, was, panic and fear panic is on one side, and on the other side is just chaos. It's a, <laughs> like no one worries about you, their bills when they've got 200 kilos on their back, or no, you're, in a, no. you're in a split. It's so, it's so important to, to actually not to understand that conceptually, but to have experienced it many times because just like the capacity to bring your awareness back to your meditation object the capacity to stay on the edge of that razor blade between well in the classics we'd say Scylla and Charybdis remember Odysseus, Odysseus's journey he was he was caught between Scylla and Charybdis anyway classical reference um, because holding yourself there is a skill exactly the same as holding your awareness on your meditation object in my book there's no difference between those skills actually they're different forms of the same skill and they are life-changing skills full stop very much now well what, what what will it take my life into you have no idea but <laughs> what we're doing in the process of, of of developing the strength or the greater capacity on both of those axes is we are removing restrictions to being ourself, whatever that is. 
we are never adding anything, whether you're talking about meditation or stretching work that we do, you're never adding anything to the being. You're only removing restrictions. Again, not an obvious thing. We are literally, gently, safely dismantling all of those choices and decisions that you've made in the past, which you made unconsciously, and all the things that you believe to be you. That, and that's a great insight in itself, that actually, Isn't it? if you can just take away restrictions, what you are at your core is the best functioning, best version of yourself. Mm. And it's so much more of a, it's such a relief to hear, because you're like, oh, well, I don't, I don't need to go and install new modules. I just need to uninstall yeah. all the, the <laughs> shit ones that are causing me to run <laughs> wrongly. Exactly. So, so there we and, go. And I think, I, and look, I don't know. I think, I'm pretty sure your, your mate Gary would say exactly the same thing. So his, um, his book is actually very much, he uses the um, human operating system as his basis metaphor for, for his book yeah all right okay quick fire questions if you've got a few more yeah so what are your thoughts on these kind of devices there's quite a few of the bio tracking um things this is a portable eeg that you might have heard of it where it so for anyone that doesn't know it's a muse headset synchronizes with your phone when you are in a deeper state of concentration the sound changes from say a, a busy sea, busy waves down to a calmer sea and birds start tweeting. And when you lose the train of thought, it becomes a more angry sea. Now I've used it for a while. My, I'll, I'll, I'll hold my, my personal thoughts on it because uh, I'm keen to hear what you, what your impression is of these things. Um, look, I think they're a fantastic device if you want to make some money. I just wish I'd thought of building them and I can see this, the um, integration with the phone too is brilliant because you can put you know, an infinite number of programs onto the phone. Um, but look, it may just be, and I, well, I, firstly, I have to acknowledge that I've not experienced them, but I have played around with binaural beats. Um, and so I know they're not exactly the same. So I'm not anti-technology. I made my own beat generating machine um, it was very simple and you can get them off the internet free these days and I spent a long time investigating theta, delta um, and the alpha state and the, and the more interesting borders between those three states uh, but then after a while it became unnecessary because I this again it's really hard to put these things into words because we do not have a language for describing sensations that has any kind of precision about it at all but the feeling of being in those states is that they are each familiar to me and let me give you an example of what I mean by that and, and I said I would come back to breath counting because this is the perfect time to do that I was on retreat in Taos New Mexico for well I have always said it's been six months but it might only have been three I really just don't remember it's so long ago now but I was working with a particularly gifted teacher um, and Another teacher had said to me before I went on this retreat, ah, well, the solution to your problems is obvious. You have to find serenity in your body. And I, what does that mean? What does serenity mean? And that became my task. What does serenity feel like? Not as a concept, but as an experience. And this is what I've learned, this is the deepest insight probably that I've had, is that unless you experience these things in an awake state and can know them so well that they then become a part of the new you, then you really haven't understood whatever it is that you're talking about at all. So the embodiment is absolutely critical, I think, and that means you have to slow down enough, and I remember your... your a colleague Gary talking about his thoughts stopping well a comment I'd say on that is you can't stop your thoughts although some schools do tell you to try to do that like empty your mind as I mentioned a moment ago but what is probably the thing that will tie those ideas up is to know that the more deeply you can relax while you're engaged in this process what you'll notice at some point and and I've always been very careful about preempting what other people's experiences will be because their experiences may not uh, they may not be what I'm describing but what many people have described is in the 
in the process of everything slowing down, you, you notice firstly that the speed of generation of thoughts definitely slows down and then at some point you'll notice that there's actually space between thoughts being generated and then some time later, and it could be a long time later, the spaces become larger than the thoughts and eventually at some point you'll realize that you're simply experiencing I am, just the experience of, of being without thoughts. So the, not, not, the image not that because, you not, used... Not because you yeah. stopped them, not because you've actively chosen to stop them, and I'm sure that someone with really strong willpower will probably think that they can do it that way. No. By fully inhabiting your physical body, being completely in sync with what's happening and feeling your pulse rate, for example, I'm always aware of my blood pressure as well. Um, these are things that you, all these things that allegedly are autonomic nervous system responses in time, you can tune into all of those things and they become real experiences for you and able to be controlled as well, if you need to. Uh, it all sounds a bit fanciful, I suppose, but... Well, the, the image that he described was um, very similar to that, which was there's the sky and it's filled with birds, like a huge flock of birds, and they're flapping about and it, the sky is black because of how many birds there are. Mm -hmm. The sky didn't go away, but it's only mm -hmm. when the birds clear and then you only see the occasional single bird fly through the sky that you're like, ah, actually the sky is the baseline and yes. the thoughts are just passing through yeah. it. And, and, and not bad thoughts. There's a famous quote from Amin Shima where she uh, scolded her students, but in a, a very loving way. She said, oh, my children, my children, you're like the naughty fish dancing on the surface of the ocean, crying out, I am the ocean, I am the ocean. That's what our thoughts are. It's such uh, a beautiful okay. way of describing yeah. it. And, and the key term in that description is naughty fish not bad fish, because thoughts are just doing what they're designed to do. In fact, if we really get down to it, um, this will spawn a whole new thread, but so many times I've been on retreat working with one particular teacher in particular, he would always be asked, well, if, if thinking is so bad, why were, we, why were we given thoughts? Why do we come into this world? We don't actually come into this world with thoughts. That's not tr accurate, but that's how it's normally put. Why are we given, or why is thinking firstly described as bad in, in, uh, in meditation schools and, and how we have to somehow wean ourselves off our obsessional relationship with thoughts and all the rest of it? Why, why were we put in, is this, is this, this guy said, is this original sin? And I think he just cracked up, he said, no. He said, we are, thoughts are given to us to create suffering. I know it sounds really weird to say that, without a stimulus to wake up, there would be no urge, no movement to wake up. And the whole of this process is designed to bring you closer and closer to the real you, or to or put it in other terms, to wake up, to be present, to be fully present. That's interesting. The well, the um, as you said last time, the the mind is a great servant but a terrible master. That's it. In another way, yes, that's it exactly. So, three more uh, quick fire sure. questions, if you have time. Yeah. Um, first one is, what do you think of mantras? Because, as far as I understand, they are a technology to, I guess give the mind something to do and artificially quiet the mind. And I've heard some people quite, quite anti mantra because they're saying it doesn't really develop. It, it's almost like a, a cheat. Whereas others say it's, it's the way to reach higher states in meditation. Well, firstly, I have very little experience with mantra. I have had some experience with it, but not a great experience. And the reason is, and this is why we need to be so careful when we're listening to the prescriptions from any teacher, because any teacher only ever talks about the experiences they had that were actually effective for them, and I'm just as guilty of that as anyone else. Um, because I found that actually experiencing, actually finding and holding the experience of serenity in my body was a life-changing process for me. And so, of course, I'm going to recommend something similar, but I, I, I don't because 
I don't because I, and I only ever say this was my own insight because it's very likely that, for example, that student you were talking about before, the one that when she sits uh, goes into a very sort of wet, gushy emotional state and, and then doesn't want to go any further into that state. Um, there is just so many different axes that one's own, uh, how shall I say, that one's own sticky areas in one's life play out. And when you listen to people talking about their personal stickiness, it will be completely different flavors for each person. But anyway, okay. mantra, let me answer that question. Mantras are actually far more powerful and have a much deeper technical, te technological basis than most Westerners have any understanding of. And I don't mean, I know I sound, sometimes pejorative and directive when I say these things, but what I mean is I've had enough exposure to mantra to understand that each of the syllables, the seed syllables as they're called, have different effects on the body and the mind. And so a mantra, if, if a mantra is given to you by a teacher who is gifted enough to actually see inside you and to be able to see, say my antidote was um, finding serenity, another teacher can say, you need these five seed syllables arranged in this particular order. They never say it like this, but that will create the change through vibrational technology as you say the mantra. And the and paradox is that the mantra that's unvoiced is actually the more powerful form of it. It's not just the physical vibrations, it's the vibrations on many axes that occur when you direct your attention. You're, you're strengthening your concentration in that too, because holding your awareness on the mantra is equally as good as holding your awareness on the sensations of breathing, if you think about it from that instrumental way. Now, mantra is extremely, can be extremely powerful. It just uh, wasn't my way in. But if I you see. have had experience with mantra, and especially if you work with some guru who really does understand mantra, um, they are, well, what's, what's the highest accolade? They can be life-changing. That's what we're trying to do. It sounds like that's maybe a key point then, because there's certainly commercialized um, methods like transcendental meditation where they say, oh, this is your secret mantra and you can't tell anyone. And they say that because really they've just given everyone the same one. It's a kind of lazy practice. Um, yes. So on that note then, on the kind of prescriptiveness, where, I mean, it's kind of a leading question because I know, anyway, <laughs> Say it. With the, the method is about down regulating your nervous system and relaxing. But equally, you excuse also. Me, excuse me, excuse me. That is one very narrow perspective. Okay. On what it is. And that is not how I would describe it. In fact, those, the techniques of what you call down regulating, or I would, would call, um, say, experiencing deep relaxation in your body that is only a technique it's only a method it's a stepping stone to something much more powerful than that i feel like you you you've preempted my question then oh sorry. so uh, well no that this is this is it then so with with this this is one side of the of the practice on the other side doing intense activity seems to have a the way that our bodies respond to it if you give yourself a injection of short acute stress then you become calmer as a result i don't know if you've seen fight club you know he says after a fight the volume in life has been turned down or doing strength training it's it's almost like an acute stressor or a cold shower or fasting or anything that, that induces a hormetic response in the individual to then cause you to adapt and to become calmer afterwards how does that fit in with your method and have you have you experimented with things like dynamic meditation or primal scream therapy or anything that's kind of on the other end of the relaxation response no and no i haven't so that's a short answer to your question i don't know anything about them so it would be foolish and a waste of time really to comment on those things I haven't had direct experience of them and so I can't really say anything useful about them. But what I will say, the general observation is that in my experience and having 
been a teacher of these and related things for a very long time now, 30, I don't know, 30 something years. The vast majority of Westerners that I come in contact with believe that they can relax, but my assessment is that they're not deeply relaxed. Very few people can deeply relax. And um, there's all sorts of reasons for that, as we've canvassed before, social media among them, the fact that we're in a pandemic at the moment, which no one seems to be able to control, and and the end different other things which people experience as um, stress or pressure in their lives. Now, you're, you're, you have a background in science, so it's probably opportune here to talk about sympathetic versus parasympathetic nervous system response. The, the human being, and this is the reason why I think cultivating the relaxation response um, is actually so much more than what you've just described it as, as down regulating and, and so on. And in fact, is the key, I think, to a, a kind of self-liberation for most people is simply because our species is expert at mobilizing the fight or flight response. How do we know that? Well, we're the dominant species on the planet to the planet's cost. That's how we know. We are experts, human beings. Our real area of expertise is killing other human beings. That has been the signature behavior of all human groups. Unfortunately. In other, in other words, periods of peace and prosperity are actually the exceptions rather than the rule. Although because humans live a certain number of years, it's always tempting to think the period of 50s and 60s and 70s is normal. Well, if you cast your mind back just another 50, 60 or 70 years to the First World War, the Second World War, the Korean War and the Vietnam War, that's only in the recent century, not to mention the hundreds of other conflicts ongoing in Africa and in the Middle East and blah, blah, blah. We are... Human beings are a warlike. We're a, we, uh, we have become skilled in doing these things and we have ruined the planet because of our capacity to elicit the fight or flight response so spectacularly. And so, and this is the key thing, that's a sympathetic nervous system response if I've got those axes right. And there is an equal and opposite parasympathetic nervous response where all the actions of the parasympathetic sympathetic nervous systems literally do the opposite. It's a bit like insulin and glucagon. Most of these chemistries in the body exist um, in a dynamic balance with one another and, in, uh, and environmental things or personal choices or other forces push the secretion of one of those hormones more than the other or the other way. Like for example when you get hungry then there's a, a stream of hormones released, but, but after you've eaten, a different stream of hormones is released, and they balance one another for the most part. Well, I regard relaxation and stimulation as being just simply two sides of the same coin, that's all. In my experience, most Westerners are not very good at eliciting the relaxation response, and that's why I've made it my life's work to work in this area, because I see... I see in our culture, especially Western culture, a tremendous and extremely dangerous imbalance of what people believe is normal and good. Good, you know, follows very closely on from normal. I know you know this. It's an incredibly seductive and very dangerous idea, potentially. Something I would maybe add to that, then, is, yes, maybe we're very good at mobilising the fight-flight response, but I think not hyper-acutely. I think we're good at chronically mobilising the yes. fight-flight response and yes. we're very atrophied and crap at mobilising the parasympathetic response. Yes. And so what's happening is we've got this, like, let's say, as if it was a, as if our adrenals are these, like, hypertrophied, like, engorged glands that are just always just leaking a bit and always a yes. little bit tense. And the parasympathetic nervous system is almost this, like, fr uh, really dried up prune um and so that's possibly why having these acute periods of intense exercise or intense stress or doing you know that's what i guess when when you sat at home and you've been in slug mode all day and you haven't moved at all and actually you don't feel relaxed you feel a bit like wound up and sometimes 
even if you do a lying relaxation practice, it's not going to be enough to, to relax you. You might have to actually go out and do some steps, go and run somewhere, go and lift some weights. And then you've calibrated because you can then kind of burn off that energy and feel the reverse. So I, it does seem like there has to be some yin yang of, of both of these, but in a, in a calibrated way, not not just a calibrated way. Um, as the relaxation is happening, you have to be aware of it. You have to learn to feel what that actually feels like. What I mean is, it's one thing to go and say run some steps and come back home and sit on the couch again and feel rejuvenated. Um, but how many times between running the steps and coming home and feeling rejuvenated did you check out as we like to say did you fall asleep um, and so the relaxation is just a sudden awareness of a change of state whereas in fact it has it had been happening but you weren't noticing it it's happening all the time but we're not noticing it the the, the look when i was first exposed to zen buddhism I was captured by an idea which I've been pursuing ever since and that is the idea of engaging with reality directly no filters, no buffers, no anaesthetic directly and that became my life's goal I want to feel as much as possible be able to discriminate these sensations and feelings as much as possible but not be held captive by any of them so that's where the non-attachment rather than detachment prescription comes in detachment as I mentioned to you in another conversation another time is a dead end you'll end up simply not feeling anything and there are some schools that practice that in my opinion they're the less desirable ones. Non-attachment, on the other hand, is something quite different, subtle, but immensely powerful. And that is, and if, if perhaps on a subsequent um, conversation we can talk about my experience with anger. Well, if we, if you got, have we got five minutes? Sure. Okay. Well, okay. Let me do it now then. I'm going to take. Take, our, take us back to 20 something years ago in my own personal history where I was sitting with one of my teachers uh, someone I love very much and we were drinking expensive cognac from memory because he's not much of a drinker so he knows I like to have a, a drink every now and again so we were sitting drinking this very expensive cognac that had been gifted to him by one of his other students <clears throat> and I made and this is why you have to be very careful when you're around your teacher because they're not asleep. They are paying attention to everything that you say all the time. That's another story. We call it being put under the blowtorch, but in the nicest possible way. Anyway, so I was having this drink with this teacher and I made the throwaway remark, which he immediately jumped on. I said, God, I'm looking, I'm so looking forward to the day when I'm not angry all the time. And he just looked at me and he said, why? I said, well, you know, um, it, it's very hurtful to the people around me. Um, it's hurtful to myself. It's incredibly distasteful, blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah, of course, I know all that. He said, let me tell you about the time of the great beings who allegedly walked the earth in the yoga tradition before the rishis came about. So we're talking about the people who inspired the rishis so a very, very long time ago. No one has any idea how, how long but it's, it's written about. And he said, the great beings were angry for the space of two or three heartbeats. And that became, in that moment, that became my goal. And here is the reason now, the strongest recommendation and prescription of why it's absolutely essential to learn to feel what's happening inside your own body. Because when you are sufficiently relaxed in normal daily life you will literally feel your body organizing itself to be angry or whatever other sticky it could be feeling tearful or sad or whatever thing afflicts you like the one we were talking about before and and then and this is the big thing because everything will have slowed down 
internally in you the moment you feel your body organizing itself to be angry because anyone who's angry will tell you precisely what it feels like and where it starts and how it transforms and zips through the body with warp speed if you're aware of those first changes you can put an interrupt into play you literally have the capacity to choose do I get on this train again? Because I know where it's going. I've got on a, I've got a PhD in upset. I, I know exactly where this is going to go and how it's going to end up. And you fail all the time. I got angry um, a couple of mornings ago, talking to Olivia about some project project that we're involved in. And I was just shocked at old familiar set of sensations. But, but anyway, the point is this: the more you practice being in touch with what's actually happening in your body not what the mind wants to be happening or thinks is happening or wishes ha happening or regretting actually happening but what's actually happening the more likelihood you have of being able to make a choice about whether to continue a behavior which is for the most part ingrained well learned and reflexive so that maybe answers you the previous question then of if there is the presence of nervous energy due to inactivity being sat, like I particularly get it if I'm in, if I'm on a long shift in a hospital, 13 hour shift, and it, or especially if it's night shift as well, where there's particular lack of awareness and you're just kind of mm. all over the place. Mm. That buildup of nervous energy you're saying is because of the lack of awareness, there are these ingrained patterns where this, the stuff builds up because of the kinked hose pipe. And that actually going for a run or something is not the solution to it. It's just a way to kind of shake it out of your system. But you well, can... well, it's it, it's it's what psychologists would call, I think, displacement activity. There is something right. happening inside you, but you go off and you do something that you know or you've been you've read about that is likely to produce endorphins. I mean, I I find all those explanations just completely fanciful. But I know that's how they're normally spoken about. Mm -hmm. So we we go with them. Um, but basically the, the net result is, as you say, you run steps and you come back and you feel better. But what I'm talking about is getting into the true dis-ease of being you. Preempting it as it's coming. What's, what's underneath? What's actually happening in the body which you're actually not consciously aware of? That's the point. It's so powerful, this idea. It's... But it's very hard to grasp, and that's why we say, look, don't worry about any of these kinds of things for now. Just pull up a cushion and sit down and just spend 10 minutes trying to hold your awareness gently on your meditation object. And, and I think that you used this expression recently, I loved it, rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat. These are subtle things and they are not the insights you cannot direct, you cannot create the moment when an insight will occur to you. And the insights are never gained by directed thinking, by the way, I'm sure that's obvious to you. An insight by its very nature is something that spontaneously arises. Oh, I'm aware of that. Mm. And this is why people have their best ideas in the shower. Why? Because they're Every not time. thinking. <laughs> they're not thinking when you're in the shower. That's the point, Yusuf. It is so powerful, this idea. In fact, anyone that ever has the awareness to recapitulate how they made any great discovery, whether it's Watson and Crick or whether whoever we're talking about, great discoveries, small discoveries, moments of insight, they will always tell you that they were doing something else. That is very interesting. What a walkthrough, Kit. Can I ask you one final question just to wrap things up? Oh. Um, yeah. This was from my flatmate who had listened to your podcasts and said, I, I really am enjoying the, the process that Kit is recommending. Um, but is there anything that he would recommend that we stop doing? Any big, any mistakes that you see people do that you think if this person just... Still hear me or whether we're still recording? Oh, uh, yeah. Just still repeat, hear you. Re repeat, repeat that. Your flatmate asked... Um, asked is is there anything that if you that, that you see people doing that you think if you just stopped doing that 
things would improve. You don't need to add anything else. Pretty much everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, look, Yusuf, this is a thought experiment, but everyone will get this. I mean, we're in, in the era of, of COVID-19 now, so people don't go to shopping centres or malls um, as often as they used to. But just cast your mind back to the last time you went to a mall. Ask yourself, when you looked at people, when you sat there watching people, did you actually see a happy human being? This is a serious question. I was in shopping malls, no. Very rarely. Well, well isn't that... In, isn't that significant? I mean, there are people going out and actualizing themselves, going out to buy something that they think they need. That's why they're in the mall. Or they're watching people, perhaps. Whatever so it is. I, but I remember, you his, with, look, I think it was you that said, when, when you spot a happy person in the street, you, you make a point of <laughs> going over and speaking to them. Always. Because of, yeah. Always. In fact, in fact I, don't, I don't have to spot a happy person like that because those happy people, and there, there are some around, they always spot me. We, you, I, because it's so rare, seriously. And so the reason why one of my teachers said if he ever starts a school, a spiritual practice school, he's going to call it the being happy for absolutely no reason at all school. The fact is, and this is, this is a big, big thing now, when you remove enough restrictions, and that's what we're talking about when we're talking about learning how to become a meditator, or when we're learning how to become deeply relaxed as an option, as an experience, as a conscious choice, and as a practice, you are, we will find, much to our amazement, that our normal state is either peaceful or happy. That actually is a human being's resting state when human beings are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so you asked a second ago, what the, the summation of this is simply to say, you have to find work to do that pleases you for its own sake. You have to be in touch with what's actually happening inside you. You can't let anyone else's foot be positioned on the back of your neck, which I see so many of my young colleagues are in a corporate situation and they are Quite literally suffering. this year as well, unfortunately. Well, that, and, that's, and that's in your workplace as well. The hierarchical structures that most people find themselves needing to be in for all sorts of reasons are fundamentally toxic unless you're fortunate enough to be working with someone who is genuinely gifted. And I'm hoping that you are working with people who are genuinely gifted and who, what's more, who are interested in helping other people that must be at the root somewhere and who are not obsessed by making money most people who become very good at doing something will make enough money to live on. Um, I'm always suspicious of people who want to accumulate as much money as possible because, just thinking about Donald Trump here, um, well, if, if you could eat money, I could, I could see a reason for it. But once you get past a certain amount, adding to that number will not materially change your life in any discernible way. So what is it that you want out of your life? I mean, I'm drawing caricatures here again, of course, but it's to make a point. The question, I have a little video on this somewhere too, the question, what do I want, is a very deep one. And it's, it is, I think you can only arrive at an understanding of what it is that you want by being still enough to have the insights that will reveal to you what it is that you want. I don't think conscious thought can take you there. And so what I want, to say my own personal philosophy now and I've written about this elsewhere in this order do some good have some fun make some money very strongly in that order and so the question then becomes of I'm in my life how can I be useful to other people because in my experience and having observed many human beings over a very long period of time now the only human beings that I've ever seen who are happy, they're never the rich ones, it is always the ones whose daily life 
revolves around being useful to other people, not actively wanting to help people in that sort of goody two shoes way that you can come across, but rather what attributes and skills do I have that this group here will find useful to them? And that's all. Do some good, have some fun, make some money. Yeah. That is some great (laughs) finishing words for that one. Kit, thanks so much for coming on. Um, That reminds me of, uh, so I'm currently reading a book called Essentialism. Uh, oh yes, I want, I want to jump. I want to jump in there. I want to jump in there. I want, I want to. I, I listened to your podcast on reading the other day. Oh yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I am going to suggest to I'm you, about my to get <laughs> that well, I'm going to suggest to you firstly, don't mistake listening to an audio book for reading because there are actually different centers in the brain that receive the information. And secondly, please don't listen to things at two point seven speed or whatever it was that you <laughs> said you were listening to things at because. <laughs> I guarantee you that if I were to debrief you after reading one of those books in that way, the understanding that you would have would be superficial. Yes, the ostensible facts, no doubt, will be remembered, especially with someone with your kind of brain. But my suggestion is if you're going to read a book, read a paper book and actually sit and read it at real time speed because reading off the page is actually a different experience qualitatively and I would argue quantitatively too from listening to an audio book so while, I, I, you're, doing, while I, you're doing something else. Yeah, no I, I would actually totally ever. agree with you, Kit. Um, <laughs> and I think that, that certainly depending on the material, it, there's, there's lots of material that's not suitable for three times speed. And yeah. the, the majority of my comprehension happens between bouts of, of reading. Um, ah, that's interesting. That's that's insight, isn't it? That's what's happening for sure. The ideas come to you in the spaces. I've um, th- there's a lot of books that I've come down to to saying actually I need to listen to this either on one times or sometimes less than one time speed, just to really sit it through. But it depends if the if the book is just in time learning and it's like I need to apply this for oh, a specific purpose, then it's just that, through. That's, that's completely different. That, that's but, completely different. But you're right. With with this book, Essentialism, this is clearly the message that I need to hear. And I've, I've, I'm actually doing both. I'm reading and listening to it. And it's at very slow speed, like bits at a time. And one of the things that you mentioned there, and a quote that I just I wrote down from earlier today was, when you know what you want, you do less because you know what you need. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. but the problem that the hard part of that is answering that question of what do you want? Yes, that is the hardest question by far. And if I may say, that I, I, there's no, I don't believe, well, I, in fact, if you said to me, I know exactly what I want and I'm pursuing it now, I would just regard that as a different kind of delusion. <laughs> I know it sounds really cruel to say that, but, but what I mean is that I don't believe that fundamentally it's the asking yourself the question on a regular basis, which is the critical part of that. It's not actually coming up with the answer. I know that again sounds a bit paradoxical, but I'm, I think I'm, I think I think I mean it. By that, by in saying that, I mean if you ask yourself deeply, "What do I want?" you often find out that you're actually in a process of doing what you don't want and that insight is just as valuable to you as knowing what you want. So allow yourself to be guided on this journey by all the I don't want this, I don't want that and I definitely don't want that and find out where you are. Sometimes that is the clearest way of getting to what you want, I think. Much easier to see that part of it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you've, you've already made some decisions about your own work, for example. You have a clarity about that as a result of the experiences you've had. That's wonderful. It's taken some time, uh, longer than I would have hoped, but <laughs> here we are. <laughs> listen, 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 let me tell you something about change. And this is the last comment I'm going to make today. Change by its nature, can never happen fast enough for the person who wants to change. So (laughs) to say that it's taken more time than I want, that is just hysterical. Sorry. Sorry Yeah, it's it's, it's the classic, isn't it? It is. Kit, this has been a fantastic chat, and I think it's going to be really valuable for 
anyone with any level of experience with meditation, to be honest, from zero well, to hero. Well, I'm not, definitely not a hero. I, I, look, I, something that's really important. I regard myself seriously as a complete beginner. I, I, a complete beginner. I have had a few insights along the way, yes, but I'm still a complete beginner. And we must talk, next time we talk, we must talk about breath counting. We don't have time to go into it now. Um, but the reason I say I'm still a complete beginner is that every time I sit down or lie down to do a practice, it is brand new for me. It is, it's brand new. Uh, and, and any experienced meditator will tell you this, depending on the circumstances, mood, phase of the moon, who knows, I'm not sure. We can, each of us, find ourselves easily distracted by the thought stream. And again, just like with a beginner, uh, the recommendation is don't be hard on yourself and just gently bring your awareness back to the meditation object, that is exactly the shape of my practice 35 years later. There's okay. nothing, nothing to be gained. There is, there is only the extraordinarily wonderful opportunity to practice. And I'm pretty sure that's what the Taoists think too. They don't believe in enlightenment in the way that it's sold in the marketplace. Um, there is only the opportunity to practice. Now, for many people who are outcome-oriented, and that's pretty much everyone who's listening today, that will not seem like a desire. Well, there, there is no end goal, that's my point. There is only being more present more often and being a better human being, as my partner reminds me. <laughs> Well, the only way to, to do it is to experience it. And we'll put all of the links and all of the resources that you've mentioned in the description um, mm. and in the show notes, and uh, people can get started right away. Look, Yusuf, thank you. I want to thank you very sincerely for inviting me on because I've said some things today, and this is always the case in the the tension, but it's a desirable tension of of trying to explain things which are really subtle and also things which don't yield easily to the spoken or written word in interaction with you allow me to say some things that I haven't ever said before and that that is the blessing of and but I still will be able to remember them in the future that's the point the the insights that we arrive at there's always it, it, they need some friction if I can put it that way and so it's really the last word I'm You're saying they need an idiot make. like me to be able to <laughs> to pull them out of you. Well, no, no, much, 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 much funnier and much better than that um, is that we're all beginners. It's just that some of us have convinced ourselves that we actually know something that's useful. But we're, <laughs> deep down, we're all beginners. And the beginner thing is it, it's about an attitude to what's happening. In my business's name used to be Shoshin. Shoshin is Japanese for beginner's mind. It also means beginner's spirit and beginner's heart too because those three concepts are coalesced in the one character in Japanese and in Chinese too. It's a, the attitude a beginner has is open and curious and able to learn. That's what I'm talking about. Most people, when they get to my age, have already made 10,000 decisions about who and what they are, and they have literally solidified, if I can put it that way. And that's why old people look and feel the way many of them do. It's, it's so sad, I think. And the reason why they move the way they do is because of the rigidity of their mental structures too, the certainty they have of who and what they are. That we create our own our own prisons. Well, that's, I we think do. that's definitely one to, to talk about in, uh, in the next one, hopefully. All right, well, I'd love to do that. I'll leave you with uh, the great uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's quote um, in English, but it was written in French, of course. He said, man is born free, but everywhere is in chains. That's what we're talking about. <laughs>